Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding the Marketing System Primer for Agribusiness Managers. I'll introduce today's presenter, Dr. H.L. Goodwin, the Senior Economist and Food Safety Director at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Dr. Goodwin is a professor and poultry economist at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, a Senior Economist and Food Safety Director at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, and the Director of Student Networking and Curriculum Enhancement for Bumpers College. He joined the faculty of the University of Arkansas's Center of Excellence for Poultry Science in Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness in December of 1997. Prior to joining the university, he was the Agricultural and Food Systems Policy Advisor to the Minister of Agriculture in Slovakia and a Fulbright Scholar in Czechoslovakia. He was faculty at Texas A&M's Department of Agricultural Economics and served as the Associate Director of the Texas Agriculture Market Research Center. He received his PhD in Agricultural Economics from Oklahoma State University in 1982. HL, the presentation is yours. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> We're going to talk today about something that a lot of people think is mysterious and sort of uh, not very well understood. But uh, the truth is, it may not be very well understood, but it's not so mysterious. I want to give us all a review, what I call a primer for ag business managers, of the marketing system. And I'm going to talk about uh, the different utilities in a market system and uh, explain how those actually operate and impact the system. There are five of these utilities and I'll talk about those in great depth. I'm going to talk about the market system functions. What does the market system do for us? And how does that all happen? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about marketing efficiency. Uh, and first, I think the key to understanding the whole marketing system and why I put it first is understanding five, the five utilities of marketing. So I want to use uh, something that many of us have seen. Many of us might own this particular item, uh, but I think it illustrates very well what I'm talking about when we speak of utilities. doesn't bear the name Victorinox. It's not the original Swiss Army knife. From the most gifted craftsman in the world comes the world's most crafted gift, Victorinox. I think the Swiss Army knife is a classic way to look at how we understand the market system. You saw the many, many different things that were on there. Scissors, screwdriver, a knife, of course, uh, a gouge, a corkscrew, an awl. I mean, there's some of these that have uh, uh, 12 different functions on them. So very, very interesting how one thing, like a Swiss Army knife, can have so many utility functions attached to it. And so that's what the market system really does. The market system is a set of market and inter-firm relationships like contracts and alliances that add utility or value to a product as it moves from the producer to the consumer. So let's talk about that just a little bit in terms of utility first, and then how price and utility are related to one another. Utility is simply the value added in a market system. And there are five types of utilities. So think about uh, a product uh, of your choice. Uh, let's, it, preferably if it's a raw agricultural product, it could be a cow, it can be a wheat growing in the field, 
can be corn, it can be whatever you might want to think about. But think about the value that's added to that specific item as you move through the marketing system. And those are the utility types. One type is form utility. Form utility. What form is the product in as it moves through the market? Time utility. Uh, is the product able to be stored? Is its shelf life extended by the marketing system? Place utility. Where is the actual product? Is it at the farm? Is it at the mill? Is it at a, a processing plant? Uh, is it at a grocery store? Where is the product? Possession utility. Who owns the product? And how does ownership really impact whether the product has value? And lastly, uh, and most textbooks won't do this, but I choose to think this is very important, information utility. And uh, I'll explain that as we get to that particular utility. So let's start off with form utility, adding value to a product by transforming its physical form. And I've got a few examples here. Actually, I started out by using wheat since uh, to me it's a very easy one to think about. The farmer cultivates the land, plants, and manages and harvests the wheat. So that's the form uh, that your wheat uh, is harvested once it's combined. It's in uh, the form that it's still in the kernel with a husk around it. Processors dry, store, clean, and mill wheat into flour etc. Many, many products that the wheat is milled into or processed into. And then the flour can be processed into food products, bread, pizza dough, pasta, so forth. Uh, it depends on the type of wheat, uh, what the end product is. Soft wheat is used for uh, crackers. Uh, hard wheat is used for bread products because it has a higher protein level, therefore a higher gluten level that gives elasticity to the dough. So uh, what, how, how is it used? Oh, and by the way, we can go through the same drill with uh, an egg. Uh, you know, the egg's laid, it's taken in, it's washed, it's grated. Uh, it perhaps is, is sold to a market as a shell egg, or maybe it's sold to a, a breaking plant to, into liquid eggs, which then goes into uh, the baking industry and is used in making uh, many, many products that you find at your market. So form utility. Time utility is where value is added through storage of the product to ensure that sufficient quantities are available when needed. Everything's not needed at one time, obviously. It's needed throughout the year. This is one of the things that uh, sort of encourages importation of products that are more perishable. They simply cannot be stored more than two or three months, perhaps, and they have to be imported from somewhere else, or they have to be uh, utilized uh, in a different form, like canned or frozen, which not only changes the form, but it also adds time utility. Cold storage facilities for chicken and beef carcasses is one that I used here as an example. Uh, grain silos is another one that I've used as an example. And then perishable products like milk and fresh fruit. So you get the idea. Anything that extends the life of the product beyond uh, its reasonable uh, process, initial processing uh, is adding time utility. Uh, these cold storage facilities, uh, at any one time, there may be a six month supply of chicken or beef or pork or whatever frozen uh, available in the market. Uh, perishable products like milk are often formed into a yogurt, cottage cheese, cheese, butter, other things that are in different forms, but that also add 
the time utility as well. Place utility, value a buyer receives from a product that's available where the buyer wants it. We talked earlier about, uh, in an earlier webinar, <clears throat> about a product being distant from the area where it's consumed and how the price uh, is therefore lower. The place utility, the transportation, moving the product from where it's produced to where it's consumed, is an example of the value of place utility. Uh, very few people want to drive 100 miles to buy a bushel of apples, uh, but they may want to drive uh, five minutes to their market to buy five pounds of apples. So that's an example of place utility. Facilitating the movement of commodities by matching buyers and sellers. And I use commodities here because we have terminal markets in Kansas City, Chicago, Omaha, and other places for certain grains or various products, uh, animal products or, or uh, bulk commodity products like potatoes and other things. <clears throat> that you can move large am amounts of commodities to uh, aggregation points to be uh, matched with buyers and sellers. Who are the players here? Trucking companies, railroads, container ships, uh, you know, and, and if you follow this, uh, this path, I'm, I mentioned dark meat chicken moving from northwest Arkansas to China. That's sort of the pathway that it takes. Uh, companies truck it to railheads. Railhead rail cars are, are loaded and they're uh, sent uh, predominantly to the west coast. Uh, in this case, Long Beach or uh, perhaps uh, Seattle or Portland and then they're shipped out in large containers uh, overseas on uh, container ships. The holidays are for family, and what turkey dinner is complete without sweet and tangy ocean spray cranberry sauce? It has been a tradition at our table for generations, and we hope you enjoy it too. So from our family to yours, Happy, Happy Thanksgiving! Thanksgiving. Okay, who likes yams? This Thanksgiving, don't forget the ocean spray cranberry sauce. I love these ocean spray commercials. Uh, seemingly ridiculous, but making a great point that it's the uh, not only the form and the time, but also the place utility uh, that is important in a marketing system. What about possession? It's the value the buyer receives from transferring ownership of a product from seller to buyer. In other words, there's a volume or a value in this transaction. <clears throat> Particularly, uh, the greater the volume, the greater the value. Wholesale seafood markets purchase seafood from different sources and distribute to local restaurants. This is particularly true uh, in the Northwest, along the East Coast, uh, along the Pacific Coast, and along the Gulf Coast is you see uh, fishermen coming in with their catches and aggregating it in wholesale uh, uh, seafood markets, which then purchase that and distribute it to the restaurant trade. Very, very uh, key part in the possession utility. And what about information utility? You know, this is, this is not mentioned by most uh, marketers uh, but information utility, there's a lot of value that buyers receive from transferring information regarding how a product is produced, what its nutritional content is, any traditional or special uses or production features from the seller to the buyer. So this can be a really a big value added aspect particularly if it's produced by local, regional, or specialty grower for resale and uh, has special cultural, nutritional, or historical characteristics. These kinds of things add value to people's consumption. So information utility is uh, really a key thing. And then uh, another aspect of information utility, which I don't have 
mentioned here on this slide is the grades and standards system that USDA has in place uh, for all the different agricultural products, whether it be grains, whether it be uh, meat products and so forth. There are grades and standards in place such that the buyer knows if they produce, if they purchase a grade A product, it meets certain quality uh, standards. So that's another key thing for information. So let's think a minute. What are some examples of firms that capture multiple or all of these particular values? Form utility, time utility, place utility, possession utility, and information utility. So just think in your own mind of examples of firms that capture these different values. I'm not going to suggest any specifically. We've talked about several. <clears throat> One I will point out, uh, a lot of the cooperatives uh, that actually got into processing products like uh, the old Land O'Lakes uh, cooperative, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that aggregated uh, dairy products, aggregated milk, manufactured the various different uh, dairy products uh, from that and then distributed that. That is an example of someone, uh, of a firm that, that took advantage of capturing really all five of these utilities. So what about price and utility and how that interfaces? Price differences among different grades of products represent form utility. We just talked about that. Differences between locations replace, re reflect place utility. It's in your transportation and handling costs. Current and future prices represent time utility. No one would store a product if they thought, uh, if they reasonably expected that the value of the product would decrease over time because they would not only lose the price of the product, but they would also lose the cost of their storage. Fees for connecting buyers to sellers are reflected in the price. That's possession utility. Uh, commissions. What is, what is a wholesaling fee? What's a distribution fee? Uh, you might think of profits moving from one level of the market chain to the next as a, really a way of reflecting possession utility. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term equilibrium, but it's a state or situation in which opposing forces balance each other and stability is attained. So what we need to understand about the market is that markets move toward equilibrium. They move where naturally where supply and demand wants to balance. Of course, this can be negatively impacted based on the individual properties of, of supply and demand. And we have to understand markets may never actually reach equilibrium, but they move toward equilibrium. In other words, you may never find the exact place where uh, the price, the offer price and the bid price are identical in market clearing but uh, the, the market's always moving toward that evidence. And we'll see this uh, in the third of our webinar series. Now, what about market system functions? We've talked about the utilities, and it's uh, well and good to understand the different utility components, but a market has to function. It doesn't just exist out here in theory. 
it actually has to function. <clears throat> and uh, so there are three things that the market must do to operate. It has to, uh, it has to have and perform the exchange function between buyers and sellers. It must perform various physical functions and it must perform facilitating functions. So we'll get into discussing these uh, sequentially as we move through the webinar. And it may be simple, it may be involved and complex, but these functions have to be performed for the market to work. So let's look at them individually. Let's look at the exchange functions. A product has to be bought and sold at least once in the market system. Even in the olden days when everything worked on a barter system and there was no, quote, price, unquote, that was uh, where products were exchanged for money or currency, there had to be at least one purchase and one sale in the market system. So it involves transferring ownership. Buyers and sellers meet to exchange commodities, and that determines pricing. So that's how price is determined. It's an agreement between a buyer and a seller on uh, <clears throat> what the price should be, what the actual value of that product is, and what value each party is willing to either accept with currency or part with currency in order to affect this exchange of the good. Buying involves a producer and a processor, a wholesaler or consumer. Selling is involves a product that can be purchased only when another participant will sell. This sounds like, you know, rudimentary and like we're, we're uh, uh, crying wolf over something that really doesn't matter. But we have to keep in mind, this is the crux of the market system. And so for ag producers, deciding when to sell is the primary marketing issue. Usually, usually producers are selling their product either to be aggregated and stored, to be processed by someone else, or to be sold by someone else. Very rarely does an ag producer control all of these different aspects of the market system. And so the when decision is the key one for ag producers. So what are the physical functions? The movement and handling of products. Transportation. Transportation is, is huge in, uh, in agriculture. When the rural road systems began to be implemented, the farm to market road systems uh, began to be implemented and roads improved, that's when we saw increases in price and increases in the type of products that were available and the quantity of products that were available and uh, we also saw greater uh, volumes at, uh, at consumer markets. So there was, there was a lot of uh, improvements here and it was based on transportation. Moving products to aggregation for distribution, storage, or manufacturing. And I think a key one here to think of is I grew up in Oklahoma. There's a lot of wheat in Oklahoma, but wheat is a pervasive product throughout the Great Plains where I spent most of my life. <clears throat> and uh, it just wouldn't work without transportation. There's no way. Storage, holding by brokers, distributors, or, or wholesalers. It can either be held in an elevator or in a cooler or somewhere, but it must be stored uh, and held by someone. So this involves not only physical functions of transportation and holding, but also the exchange function that we just talked about uh, where ownership is transferred. And then processing. This can be drying, freezing, canning, milling, 
you know, whatever, uh, whatever type of processing <clears throat> that we're looking at. But that is a physical function of the marketing system. So we've had exchange of goods through ownership. We've had uh, the transportation, storage, and processing. And I've selected uh, another commercial. Many of you may think all I do is watch television, but these commercials hit on key themes uh, that we're all familiar with and that fit very well. So I've got one of my favorites here to highlight uh, the physical functions of the marketing system. Attention. At Florida's Natural, we're a small co-op of growers. Come on, guys. We own the land, the trees, and the company. So our premium orange juice is made just from our fresh oranges, not from concentrate. Florida's natural. It's as close to the grove as you can get. Now that's just in time delivery. I mean, I think that's a beautiful example of what we're talking about with those uh, first two, uh, with those first four pieces of the broad marketing system functions. <clears throat> So now let's look at the facilitating functions. Activities that help the, operate, the market system to operate smoothly. Market information, whether it be public or private. <clears throat> this are the grades and standards, the uh, public reports that we have on volumes of products that are moving in and out of the market. There are all types of private firms uh, that you could subscribe to if you're in the uh, industry that give you reports on how product is moving uh, inside the uh, food business. Risk bearing, quality, quantity, and price. These are all measures of risk, and we talked about these in the risk assessment webinar. But quality, quantity, and price are measures of risk bearing. Standardization and grading, that's the USDA function that I spoke about just a few minutes ago that relates to specific product quality and specific characteristics. So those, in fact, are the facilitating functions of the market system. And so if we understand uh, the utilities and if we understand the facilitating functions, uh, the ownership functions, and the transportation functions or, or movement functions that actually uh, physical functions that actually make the market system operate, then we're in the position uh, when we look at the financing uh, to estimate what our lines of credit need to be, what our price risks need to be. Uh, you know, lines of credit are very important. If everything was operated on a cash only basis and you had to have cash in your hand before you could purchase something, uh, the market system would be very efficient. It would be like it was uh, 100 years ago, and uh, the, the uh, diversity and the quantity and quality of the products that would be available for consumers would be drastically reduced, and so would the profit. So financing is a major, major facilitating function. In fact, I would almost say that uh, of everything up here, Financing and standardization and grading are the two most important facilitating functions, although they're all quite important. So what's our third component? Market system efficiency. And it's a measure of productivity of the market process in terms of the resources used and the output generated during the process. So <clears throat> inputs and outputs. That's what we're talking about. We're looking at ratios of inputs and outputs. And so let's look at our first one. The first thing we want to do is increase the output to input ratio. We want more out of the market than we put into it. Uh, unfortunately, this is what happens to me when I eat uh, a lot of desserts around the holidays. I get more weight out of my eating than it seems to be pleasure inputting uh, the food into my system. Uh, so let's look at this. Uh, there are three ways to do this. You can do it by keeping output the same 
while input decreases. So the same amount of market movement, product through the market, with fewer inputs uh, as far as the marketing uh, inputs. You can increase output with input remaining constant, or you can increase output more than you increase input. These are just mathematical relationships. Think of it in this way. How much product flows through the market system and how much input does it require for that product to move? And if you can get an increase in the ratio of value of movement through the system, then it costs you to input it into the system, then you have market system efficiency. <clears throat> so there's operational efficiency, it's a technical component, <clears throat> it measures the efficiency of performing the market system function within the firm. What are some, uh, and then there's pricing efficiency. It measures how adequately market prices reflect production and marketing costs in other conditions throughout the system. So there are really two ways, only two ways that we, uh, that we two things that we measure. That's operational efficiency and pricing efficiency. So let's look first at operational efficiency. It's a technical relationship, marketing output, divided by marketing input. What are some measures of this? Output per worker hour. This is a big thing that we hear all the time. Uh, worker efficiency in the US uh, was kicked upward last month. In other words, people were putting out more output for the same level of input. That's a good thing, technically. Sales per employee hour. Obviously, if you, uh, get more sales based on the hours of sales input, that's efficient. Increased operational efficiency is synonymous, synonymous with cost reduction. And you know, this is what's been happening in agriculture for decades and decades, is the technical efficiency of agriculture as far as operations has continued to increase uh, irrespective of what the market has done and that has kept agriculture in a growth mode and, and in a mode where it's been able to survive and, and even expand. What are some examples of increased technical efficiency in agriculture over the years? Let's try to think of some of these. Uh, I've got one that I'm going to show you kind of an example, but uh, think about this while, I, while we uh, look at the next video clip that we've inserted here for you. What happens when agriculture goes high tech? Farmers using what's known as precision agriculture can harness the power of science and technology to improve their land's productivity. This can be done in many ways and at any point in the process but most farmers begin by collecting data about their own farms. For example, smart combines can detect differences in yield among fields while harvesting. Soil maps can reveal the soil structure and chemical properties. And mobile weather apps can provide short and long-term forecasts. Computers then analyze all this information and help farmers decide how to make each field as productive as possible. Once the farmers have their analysis in hand, they can put it to use. GPS-guided systems help steer machinery, reducing seeding and spraying overlap to less than an inch. Variable rate technology places specific amounts of fertilizer and pesticide on each part of a field. Monitors and other sensing technologies, such as drones, track field conditions. So what do farmers stand to gain? Well, by using guidance systems and variable rate technologies, small farms saw an average gross annual benefit of $11,000. Typical size farms stand to gain even more, and large farms reap the greatest return with the technology paying for itself in less than two years. A pretty sweet reward after a hard, high-tech day's work.
Well, I think that was an excellent illustration of, of what happens when you get these operational and technical efficiencies and what that's really done for agriculture. Uh, let's move on now and look at pricing efficiency. I won't spend much time here because uh, it's seemingly obvious once we point it out, but how effectively do prices reflect the cost of moving output through the market system? <clears throat> if your price does not adequately uh, reflect the cost of moving the product through the system, you either, one, will not sell the product, it will be out of line and nobody will pay for the value of the cost, or two, <clears throat> you will forfeit profits and you'll go out of business because you haven't used an efficient pricing scheme to move your product through the market. If you have an efficient market, the price of the product or service would not be different from its price if no firms were large enough or had enough power to impact the price. So that's that's what a perfectly competitive market is. And in theory and by definition, perfectly competitive markets are the most efficient markets. In other words, they're markets where no firm can affect uh, the movement of a product or a service through the market based on price. Uh, so that's what price efficiency is. The third thing that we need to understand with efficiency, and I go back to this again in a different form, is legislation and marketing systems that control standards for agricultural products, uh, that help regulate price floors and ceilings. Uh, certain products have price floors and ceilings that are set by agricultural policy, uh, and it's tied to loan rates. It's a it's a complex issue, but it's something that we'll be going through uh, in greater detail uh, at the Youth Summit, if for those of you who attend. Uh, there are health standards and labeling, so-called sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Uh, these are very, very important to communicate into the understanding of the market system and to efficiently transmit information that consumers uh, and sellers are interested in. Legislation affects every facet of the ag market system. Uh, we like to think of agriculture as being in a space that's free uh, and, and competitive, but we have to be realistic to understand that there is legislation that affects every part of the ag market system. And this has evolved over many decades to uh, address different situations that arise to help ensure that agriculture uh, continues to operate, that consumers are protected from adverse occurrences, and to try to ensure that we have uh, a safe, reliable, and accessible uh, food for our citizens in the country. And this is a imparted through congressional action and through USDA and its various agencies, also the Food and Drug Administration. So with that, I will end the uh, webinar on understanding the market system. If you have questions, please write them and email to me, uh, Dr. H.L. Goodwin at hlgood at uark.edu, and uh, I will respond to those as I can. Thank you very much.